presentation tonight on the uh, venture to Pluto by um, Mark Cotte. Uh, he's been working for many years at uh, APL, working on uh, Hubble Space Telescope, and he's worked on the Horizon mission for, I guess it's been going for about nine years. He's only been on for a year and a half, but it's been going for quite a few years. And he's going to tell us about the history of it and also uh, what, what's happening right now. Now, we also have a book that just got published. See, the book's not there yet, but got published on Monday. And so whoever wins it will send you the book. But this is just fresh, fresh before the press. <laughs> it's being pressed right now. And um, Mike's got uh, 94 slides. So we've got 45 minutes, so we better get going. Good evening, everyone. Oh, okay. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Have a good dinner, have a good evening. Ready for the snowstorm? Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, um, real quick, I work on, the, one of the jobs I do is I work on the uh, New Horizons mission as a mission analyst. Uh, I do uh, scheduling, uh, sequencing for one of the instruments on the mission. Prior to that, I worked on Messenger, which was a spacecraft that orbited Mercury for a bunch of years until it crashed last year. And well, that was on purpose. And before that, as uh, Gundar mentioned, I worked on the Hubble for a number of years. So this evening, what I'm uh, here to do is give you guys uh, a tour of the New Horizons of Pluto. And to start with, I want to give you a little bit of background so you have everything in context. So if the lights can come down, we'll get started. The lights are stay up, lights down. So um, our solar system is really a very, very complex environment. We have all kinds of objects. We have a giant gas ball. We have these rocky worlds here. We have these uh, giant uh, gas giants here, and then we have uh, other stuff beyond that. Uh, unlike any of the hundreds of other exoplanetary solar systems that we found, nothing we've seen out there so far resembles what our solar system looks like. But we divided it right now, from our understanding, into three zones. Zone one is the inner zone, which goes from the sun out to the asteroid belt. And it comprises uh, of the rocky worlds, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Zone two is the gas giants, or you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And it goes from basically the asteroid belt outwards to the Neptunian orbit. Beyond Neptune is what we call now zone three. Zone three is this region that extends from Neptune's orbit out to about 50 astronomical units, where one astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So we're talking 30 to 50 times further out than the Earth-Sun distance here. It's the least known of the three zones because everything out there is very small, it's very faint, and the few spacecraft that have traveled through it have detected nothing up to, up to well, now with uh, New Horizons. Um, Pluto is part of that zone. Uh, it's this disc-shaped area here, and then, there, and then what's beyond that, we don't know. Um, uh, that's not me moving it. It's, it's a ghost. Um, so this zone out here is comprised of millions of tiny, small bodies. You know, by that, we're, we're talking meters to tens of meters across. There's probably on the order of about a thousand uh, dwarf planet-sized objects, Pluto and smaller, but still large enough to be round bodies out there. We just haven't seen them all yet. Uh, we're, we're barely scratching the surface of what we can see with the technology that's available to us now. So uh, a little history on Pluto itself. It was discovered back in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh. He was uh, asked by uh, Percival Lowell, astronomer at the time, to look for planet 10 because there was this con they were convinced that there's another planet out there and it's got to be found. So uh, he hired Clyde to start looking at these plates that were taken over time and do what, they do, what they, do what they call a blink study, where they would blink one plate and then uh, blink another plate and see if anything would move between the two plates. 
eventually, over time, he discovered Pluto. He also discovered asteroids. He discovered all kinds of things. He discovered a comet, uh, ga galaxies, star clusters, all kinds of things that no one had ever seen before. When he made his discovery and, and uh, made it known, people started going back in time on earlier plates to see if Pluto had been imaged before and discovered that for 15 years, people had been taking images of it, but no one recognized the fact they'd seen it. But so Pluto, when they, they took the images, they started calculating the orbit, and they discovered it's an oddball planet. It's unlike the other classical eight planets. Its, it's orbit's really inclined. It's very elliptical. It's very small. But we have nothing else like it, so it's part of the planetary bodies. At the time, they didn't have a, um, a name for it, but word got out into the community that we have this body out there beyond Neptune, and an astronomer out in, in England uh, was having breakfast one morning and telling his daughter about it. And his daughter, who was uh, versed in mythology and the mythological uh, histories, said, well, why don't you name it Pluto? Because, well, Pluto stays with the, the pantheon that we have for all the other planets. And Pluto's the uh, lord of the underworld and the uh, king of the invisible. And Pluto, the body that we just found, is very small. It's in a very dark part of the solar system, and it's nearly invisible for the telescopes of the time. Um, this got back to Clyde Tombaugh, and he said, you know, that's very cool because it not only stays with the Pantheon, but the first two letters of Pluto are Percival Lowell's initials, who had hired him to do the research in the beginning. So hence Pluto. Now Pluto, it's really, really far away. You can see here, if you were to take a bicycle from Earth to Pluto, it would take you about 47,000 years. Your muscles would be really good, but you might be a little old. Uh, even the space shuttle would take 25 years at the speed it would go. Uh, New Horizons, we were able to get there in nine and a half years. So we kicked butt with the rocket technology we had to get out there. Um, so what more do we know about Pluto? Uh, we, this is a... a Graph down here showing you how inclined the orbit is relative to the other planets in the solar system. So you see it's different than the other planets. Um, it has a period, or an orbital period, of just under 250 years. Uh, this uh, a schematic over here will, will give you uh, points where Pluto was in orbit and things that happened here on Earth. Like the end of the Civil War was uh, when Pluto was at, at the furthest point uh, in its orbit from the sun, at aphelion. Uh, down here, 1930 is when we discovered it. Uh, the Apollo uh, moon landings were here in 69. The discovery of Charon here. Perihelion is the closest point in the orbit to the sun. And um, New Horizons were launched here, and we had the flyby here. So... Pluto is also very small, I and mean, it's, it's barely half the size of Mercury, which is pretty small in and of itself. And if you compare those to Earth uh, and Venus, they're, they're fairly pretty tiny. But again, even though we had all these odd characteristics of Pluto, you can't have a category one, so we call it a planet. And at the time, there was no, no uh, debate as to what a planet was. That all came about later, when with the advent of Hubble and the uh, better technology that Hubble had with the advanced camera for surveys and such, started detecting other bodies out in zone three in the Kuiper belt and measuring them to be on the order of Pluto or large enough to be round. So they were called Plutoids or called uh, Kuiper belt objects, but they were large. And then they discovered Eris and they measured the size of Eris, and Eris was within a few percent the same size or if not larger than Pluto. And the whole debate about whether Pluto is a planet and what is a planet all came up. I'm not gonna go into all that. You, you know, we can take that offline. But for the purposes of this talk, Pluto is a dwarf planet, and a dwarf planet is a subset of planet, where rocky bodies are a subset of a planet and giant uh, gas giants are a subset of planet. They're just another subset. So uh, in 2006, the IAU did their uh, little vote thing and came up, they decided that, okay, we're going to classify Pluto as a dwarf planet and all the other planets that are in its same ilk as dwarf planets. Um, and even though they don't like to be called dwarf planets, they like little planets. 
So the Pluto system. Pluto uh, is, is the largest body in its, its uh, conglomeration of companions. And I note that it has five known companions, not five known moons. Now we'll touch on that in just a moment. Uh, Charon, which is also pronounced Sharon, uh, was discovered in 1978. Two small moons, Nix and Hydra, were later discovered in 2005. And then one more moon, Kerberos, was discovered in 2011, and then another moon in 2012. All this time, New Horizons is flying out to Pluto before we even knew these moons existed beyond uh, the companion Karen. So the, there was a little bit of concern about, well, what else is out there, and are we going to hit anything? Um, stopping with Karen for a moment, Karen is about half the size and about the eighth the mass of Pluto. It's large enough to be round, and it's massive enough that it doesn't actually orbit Pluto, but it orbits a point between the two. So they're basically a binary planet system, if you consider Charon to be a dwarf planet. It's not officially been ratified as such, uh, but if it were to be, this would be a unique system in our solar system in this be only binary planetary uh, objects that we know of to date. Everything else, the, the, our moons around those planets. So here's an image of Pluto, and the numbers you see here are what we call magnitudes, or brightness uh, of a, a star. The smaller the number, the brighter the star. Your eye, on a, a perfectly dark night, can see down to about sixth, and some people can see pushed towards seventh magnitude. Once you get beyond seventh magnitude, you need optical aid, telescopes, binoculars, and stuff to be able to see. So you see this star is very bright compared to the others at 9.2 magnitude. And a lot of the magnitudes go in increments of uh, ten to death in tens on the decimal point. And if you see Pluto and compare it to all these other things here, it's, it's fairly faint. This is a ground-based uh, set of observations taken by a gentleman named Ken Grown uh, over a period of three days. And you can, if he didn't have the arrow here, you would be hard-pressed to pull Pluto out from the background on this. And this was an image that was taken by the Cassini spacecraft last uh, summer uh, within, uh, I think, within a, less than a day of the flyby of New Horizons to Pluto. Can you guys pick out Pluto in this? <laughs> so there's Pluto. You know, this is what it looks like from Saturn, all right? Very, very remarkable. And this is with the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay? This is in 1996, and this is what Hubble could get. Uh, now, you can take that, and then you can start doing uh, deconvolution on it, and you can get this. And you can see there's features here. The resolution, though, is each pixel is about 300 miles across. So you're not going to be reading license plates of the Plutonian uh, drivers. But you can see there's light and dark areas. The light and dark areas didn't change over time. They stayed the same as Pluto rotated on its axis. And we knew Pluto rotated a little over six days. So a little over six days later, they could look and take the same image. And then in 2010, when Hubble got the advanced camera for surveys, uh, they were able to get higher resolution images. But again, this is the best we could do. Now, Hubble is a vaunted telescope. It's an amazing machine. It has revolutionized what our view of the universe, not only on the scientific front, but on the home front of just the layperson who just looks at the photos and is amazed. This is the best they could do with Pluto. And that's because Pluto is so small relative to the stuff that Hubble typically looks at. So it, it's just not designed to look at Pluto. So we have to actually go there. So this is New Horizons. You can see right here a couple of uh, folks in their uh, little clean suits. And you see how big uh, New Horizons is next to them. Uh, New Horizons was years in coming. Uh, we had a number of missions that were proposed to NASA during, or, or submitted during their proposal reviews. And for over 11 years, uh, Alan Stern and the Pluto Underground team would, would make proposals about, we want to do this one. OK, we're going to redo it, and we're going to call it Mariner Mark II. OK, now we're going to recall it and Pluto, Pluto Fast Flyby, and so on and so forth. 
Well, it wasn't until 2001 that we got New Horizons. And within record time, we were able to go from getting the proposal to building the spacecraft to launching the spacecraft in just under five years. So the cost of the, the mission is, is essentially less than the average cost of a football stadium anymore. Uh, the Mission Operations Center is here on campus. It's just a few buildings away. And this is what the, uh, the Mission Operations Center looks like. And as a little bit of trivia for you, uh, Clyde Tombaugh was not alive to see the flyby of Pluto. He passed away a few years before, but he had mentioned, uh, well, a few years before launch of New Horizons, mind you. But he had mentioned that if he, wanted, if he were to go anywhere, he wanted to go to Pluto because that was, well, his planet. He discovered it. So Alan Stern got a hold of his family and said, hey, we're sending a spacecraft to Pluto. Can we have some of his ashes? And we have bolted on the side of the spacecraft a little container of Clyde Tombaugh's ashes. He's the first human to visit Pluto. How cool is that? So the, the, the spacecraft is not big. It's basically the size of a baby grand piano. So if you, you go to a hotel, the fancy hotel, and have a piano in the, in the corner, you can go stand next to it and say, that's the size of the spacecraft. Well, there's the size of the spacecraft. <laughs> um, we built it here at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, it's powered by a radioisotopic thermoelectric generator. It carries seven science instruments on board, and it has two solid-state recorders where we store all the data. The instruments are Lori, Rex, Ralph, and Alice. Uh, Ralph and Alice are not acronyms. They're named after two characters from the Honeymooners from the 1950s show. And we have Pepsi, SDC for student dust collector, and SWAP. This is, SWAP is the uh, instrument that I work with. The student dust collector I'd like to uh, highlight just for a moment because the cool thing about the student dust collector is it is the only instrument that was completely designed and built by students and is flying on a spacecraft. And some of the students uh, who are down here uh, are still following uh, the spacecraft and doing their research on the data that's coming back from their dust collector. So these are uh, the topics that uh, we, when we made the proposal, we said, okay, these are what we're going to do when we get to Pluto. Uh, these are the required things, doing a global geological and morphology mapping. Uh, we're doing surface composition studies. We're going to be studying the atmosphere. Uh, we hope to learn about the energetic particles, and we're searching for new rings, new moons, and magnetic fields, and a host of other uh, items that we're there to try and learn about, because we're getting one shot at this planet. So we launched in January 2006. You know, five years, barely five years after we got the proposal from approval from NASA. We flew past the moon in nine hours, which is very fast. The previous record holder was Pioneer 10, which got by in 11 hours. Uh, a year, uh, 13 months later, we flew past Jupiter, which is, again, another record. All the other spacecraft you can see here took a little more than a year and a half to, uh, well, several years to get to Jupiter or beyond. And then nine and a half years after, we, did, we had our flyby. So this is a, a little uh, illustration, a GIF image uh, by a gentleman uh, named Clay Baver who put this together. If you're in a 747, that's what it would look like. If you're the SR-71 Blackbird, if you're on New Horizons, looking out the same window. Just to give you an idea of the, the speed differential here. So this is the first image we uh, took of Pluto about uh, nine months, eight months into the mission. And as I mentioned, we flew past uh, Jupiter in uh, 13 months later. And we used Jupiter's flyby to give us a gravity assist. If we did not, we would still be upwards of five years away from getting to Pluto because we, we just didn't have enough speed to get out there that fast. Going past Jupiter, we got enough speed to, to cut off that five years. And this was a planned uh, flyby of Jupiter. It also allowed us to exercise the science instruments on the spacecraft to you know, verify that they're working properly and get some different unique science at Jupiter. Um, you can see down here, 
is uh, the moon Io, and you can see that little plume right there. It's a 10-frame GIF image of a volcano that's erupting on Io as we were flying by, which is, I don't know, I thought it was pretty damn cool. My favorite image is the one of Europa rising be, uh, over uh, Jupiter's limb right here. So while we're heading out, this whole time, nine and a half years before we get to um, Pluto, we're not sitting idle. The mission operations team is working on all kinds of contingencies, you know, doing the what ifs, this, that, and the other. Uh, we are uh, always uh, checking the, the, the trajectory of the spacecraft relative to where uh, Pluto is and doing measurements to see if Pluto's orbit is a little bit faster, a little bit slower than we think it is as seen from Earth. You know, everything is uncertain. There's always little uncertainties that can happen, and those little uncertainties build up over time and could throw us wildly off. So we really wanted to make sure we were as close as possible without crashing into the planet. That would be bad. And we wanted to be as close to the planet and have all the timing set up because everything has to be done programmed ahead of time because we can't joystick the spacecraft. You can't just say, well, I'm going to move the spacecraft over here. Now and look at this. Now I'm going to look at this. And now I'm going to look at this. We can't do that. The light time lag is on, on the order of four and a half hours. So if you send a signal out, it's going to take four and a half hours to get there. And then the spacecraft is going to do what it's going to do. So what we do is we build command load sequences, which are a series of commands uh, that span a week or two weeks, depending on how heavy the command load is for what the spacecraft's going to do during that time. And it marches through this little calendar of events, and the calendar says, you're going to look over here, now you're going to point over here, now you're going to do this. And it's, it's down to like, you know, a tenth of a second or so, what's going to happen where? We, we measure this very, very precisely. Now, we're trying to do this nine and a half years ahead of time, so we're planning all this out to make sure we get it right. And we're going through all these different uh, contingencies. Well, what if this happens? What do we do? What if this happens? What do we do? What if there's another moon discovered? What do we do? You know, remember, we launched in 2006. We discovered uh, moons after that. So we were concerned that there may be more moons. And we had different trajectories planned should we discover yet another moon in orbit around Pluto that we could be in danger of getting too close to and hitting. Fortunately, um, we did not discover any more moons, that there were no more to discover, so we did not hit anything, and we were able to stay with our planned trajectory. Now, despite all the, all the preparation that one can do, there's always going to be a gotcha someplace. Our gotcha came four days before we entered the command load for the actual sequence. And it was one of the things we had list, on the list of things, well, we're going to get to this, oh, we're not going to get to this, it didn't happen. Well, it happened in real life. It happened on 4th of July weekend. And uh, you know people were off on holiday, and the flight operations team were sitting there, and then they suddenly realized, hey, we don't have a signal with these spacecraft anymore. And so they checked, and they said, Something, something's wrong. And they started making phone calls, sending emails out. Different uh, engineering teams came in, and we worked the problem. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details, but we worked the problem. It took us a few days, and people stayed here uh, for several days running, never went home. You know, food was brought in, the cots were set up, people slept in their offices, but we worked the problem, we got it going. Basically, what happened with the, the spacecraft had the, the main processing unit had a blue screen of death action happen. It reset, and we had just dumped the core, uh, the memory out of it when it reset and they didn't know what to do. The backup computer saw all this happen and put the spacecraft in safe mode and said, hey, Earth, um, we got an issue. So we were able to work the problem, but it took several days to get recovered because, again, the light time, the time lag uh, uh, for the spacecraft, the round trip light time is nine hours. Four and a half hours is one way to send a signal. Four and a half hours later when we get the signal back, it takes time to do these. And then you know, we send the, the, the reboot command up, it takes time for it to happen. Then we get back and see, okay, did it actually reboot properly? All this stuff has to happen. So this is why it takes days for us to get things going. Fortunately, during this time, we lost no critical science. We lost some images, uh, approach images that we had planned, but nothing critical was lost. And it was, um, we had the spacecraft back in healthy mode by July 6th, and on July 7th, we entered what we called the 
uh, the flyby mode or the encounter sequence. So this is the uh, trajectory of the flyby here, and this is the orbital plane of the moons. Um, at this point in the flyby, we had told the spacecraft, at this point you're going to stop taking uh, science, you're going to turn back to Earth, and you're going to do what we call a phone home, just to let everyone know that you didn't hit something. And we knew what time this was going to happen, and we knew that was going to be later in the evening. So this is in the morning, so we had the big celebration. Yeah, we did the flyby, everything's, you know, we hope everything's fine, but this would be the time we did the flyby. Then the rest of the day we waited and waited and waited, and it, it was a little tense while we are waiting to get the phone home signal. Uh, as soon as we got the phone home signal, you could just feel the tension in the room just wash away, and everyone was, we're done. We've done what we need to do. We've got the flyby. Now we just got to download all the data. So this is an approach uh, movie. You, that little X right there is the very center between Pluto and Charon. So you see how they rotate around each other. Uh, these are some of the early approach images that we took. Uh, by the time May came around, we were doing better than Hubble could do. And uh, then a few days out, we got this image, and the scientists were going, oh my god, look at this. This is so fantastic. Oh, drool, drool, drool. The next day, another image would come out, and they forget about the previous one, and they repeat with this one. And the next day, another image would come out, and they forget about that one, and go to the next one. And it was kind of amusing to watch this happen, but it was also very cool because we were seeing things no human had ever seen before. And, you know, and this whole area right here, unfortunately, we didn't get the close part of the flyby. So we're not going to have the same high-resolution images as we did on this side of the planet. But we still have data of the planet that had never been seen before. So we're going to be focusing on this for the rest of the evening here. So the, the names on Pluto are very informal. They've not been ratified by the IAU. Um, I can read a few of them here for you. This is uh, Pioneer Terra. This is Voyager Terra. This is Hayabashi Terra. This is Lowell Regio. This is the Cthulhu Regio, for those of you who are into your uh, horror. Uh, the dark areas down here are also based on similar uh, type of deities. Um, and the Tombaugh Regio is the big area here, and then the, the big white spot is the Sputnik Planum. It's this large glacier-like uh, feature on the, on the planet. So looking at Sputnik Planum, you, you look at this thing and there's all this stuff going on that we had no idea was going to be there. You have these hill clusters, you have this cellular terrain, you have these upland, upland areas, you have chains of hills, you have pits. You, there's all kinds of things happening. This is a very dynamic environment. This is not a dead world by any stretch of the imagination. Looking at some of the detail here, you can see all these pits that are just littering the surface of the Sputnik Platinum Glacier. You can see the cellular terrain boundaries here and, and more pits and, and some hills that are e e extruding from beneath the glacier. And more hills over here. And this is, this is just phenomenal stuff. You come down off of the glacier a little bit and you get into the, these mountains. These mountains here, this one was the first one that was named, this is the second one named, these again are unofficial names. Uh, they're 11,000 feet tall, and they're made of water ice. And at the temperatures that are here on Pluto, water ice is stable and can be 11,000 foot tall mountains. So if there's any ice climbers in the audience, uh, we, have some, we have some route problems for you to solve. The Norgay Montes were named after Tenzing Norgay, who was the first Sherpa to climb Mount Everest, along with Hillary, Sir Edmund Hillary. And if, uh, and as a rock climber, if they, the IAU ratifies this, I will be very happy if Norgay Montes are kept, because if that's so, Norgay's name will be the first Nepalese name that's put on a solar system object. Uh, these blue areas here are uh, exposed water ices on the surface of the planet. And uh, the, there's more mountains here, and then you've got this cavity down here. This cavity turns out, there's one here and there's another one down here. These are cryovolcanoes. They're not active right now, they weren't erupting, but they are cryovolcanoes. And so again, the, the 
whole of the Sputnik Planum. Um, it's basically a large glacier. You can see the nitrogen ice flows. It's made of nitrogen methane primarily. You can see all the flows on the inlands here. You can see how it breaks up as it gets to these, these mountainous uh, icebergy mountains here. Um, a close up, you can see these, these, these cracks that are formed in the ice flow and then the giant ice water mountains here that it's, it's butted up against. And then you've got these, these other terrain. They, the, the informal name for this is snakeskin terrain. Um, it's all very, very linear in this direction here. Um, again, this is uh, uh, indicating that the, the, the primary ices uh, that make up the Sputnik Planum are basically methane and nitrogen with some, some carbon monoxide. Uh, we've done some crater studies of the planet, uh, and these dots all indicate where we've seen craters. And if you'll note that on the Sputnik Planum, there's really nothing which tells you the Sputnik Planum is very, very young. Uh, on the order of uh, you know hundreds of thousands millions of years, not billions, um, but there's no indication of any cratering here. So this area is a dynamic environment, and it's just a montage of the a variety of the terrain that we've seen on Pluto. And not only do we look uh, we look at the surface of Pluto, but we looked at the atmosphere of Pluto. We wanted to know what the atmosphere is composed of. Well, we learned that it's blue. Um, it's not a super brilliant blue like on Earth, but, it, but it's, it's blue. And it has layers. That's not JPEG artifact. These, these are actual layers in the atmosphere. And close up here, you see the layering in, the, these, in these, this haze atmosphere. And you can see the, the Norgay Montes right here. At this, so this was taken after we flew by as we're looking back at the planet. The Norgay Montes, again, 11,000 foot tall mountains, and then the atmospheric layers layering here. If you look straight down at the Terminator, the, the day-night transition point, you can see in the atmosphere, again, another evidence that, you know, data point that there is an atmosphere is the shadows being cast in the haze by the mountains as of the setting sun. And if you were to take the Terminator image and stretch it, you would be able to pick up stuff on the dark side of Pluto relative to the sun from the light scatter in the atmosphere. So uh, what we, the way we measured the atmosphere is what we did was we took um, an observation, looking back, we're doing radio uh, signal uh, study, and we would see the attenuation here fall off as we got deeper and deeper into the atmosphere, and then as we hit the surface of Pluto, it would drop down nothing, and then as we came back from behind Pluto, it would slowly then come back out. We also wanted to see if we were going to have an atmosphere around Charon. And again, we, didn't, we had to know exactly where Charon was going to be at this moment, at, at when we flew by, nine and a half years before, to get this. But we see, here's a signal, here's a signal, signal drops as we go behind Charon, and then picks back up. No atmosphere on Charon. So we have two bodies orbiting each other. One has an atmosphere and one does not. Kind of unusual, kind of odd. So this is a movie here to play real quick. It's a 30 second movie of the fly by itself. So you'll watch, we'll approach the, uh, the system here. And as we fly by, it'll slow down a little bit. And then as we pull away, watch as the, the planet goes dark and then we'll do an occultation with the sun is how we did the, uh, the measurement of the atmosphere. First of Pluto, you see the atmosphere, and then of Charon right here. So it blinked away. You guys want to see it again? They want to see it again. I didn't have a soundtrack for the sorry guys. You're more than welcome to sing. I gave a talk to a fourth grade class once uh, when I worked on Hubble, and I had a movie that didn't have any soundtrack, so one of the kids started humming the, uh, the Jaws theme. <laughs> so, okay, now that, that was Pluto. Um, uh, real quick, I want to cover Karen, and uh, I think we're going to be almost out of time at that point. Uh, Karen was discovered back in 1978 by uh, James Christie, a gentleman sitting right here. He was uh, looking at 
uh, images of Karen, he kept seeing this little bump. And he noticed, after looking at a lot of images, that that bump repeatedly came up on a periodic basis. Previous astronomers had looked at it and dismissed it as artifacts with the instrumentation or atmospheric effects or something and said, didn't think anything of it. He said, this thing shows up every so many days in this same spot. There's got to be something here. But we didn't have the resolution to separate these two bodies. But everything else that they, they, they looked at said, this has got to be something that's orbiting Pluto. At the time, we didn't know it wasn't necessarily orbiting Pluto, but the point between, but beside the point, we had another body out with Pluto. Um, with uh, New Horizons, this is uh, about a month out, our view of Charon, and during the flyby. Now, we purposely set the flyby up so that we would be on the far side of Pluto from Charon, just in case there was a bunch of debris around Charon that we couldn't see. So we're looking at Charon from further away than we were Pluto, so the resolution is a bit lower, but still, the stuff here that had never been seen before. You got this giant uh, break across the planet here. You got this very reddish dark area in the north. You got craters galore. In this corner over here, you have this, what looks like a, a sunken mountain, for lack of a better description. Uh, there's just um, all kinds of activity that's happened on this planet. There's cracks, there's canyons, there's cliffs, there's craters, all kinds of things. And because we have no official names, we have a bunch of uh, informal names of things. So the big plane here is called Vulcan Planum. Uh, let's see, test your guys' science fiction here. Um, the chasms are called Argo, Serenity, Macross, Tardis, and Dostromo. Uh, craters are called like uh, Vader Crater, Organa Crater, Skywalker Crater, Ripley, uh, Alice Crater, Nemo Crater, Kirk Crater. You get the idea where the scientists who came up with these names were going for it. Okay? If they keep these names, that will be very cool. The inspiration for these names. The dark area up on top is called Mordor. So quickly, uh, the small moons of Pluto. Uh, we have Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. And, and then, you know, by comparison, there's Charon. So these things are tiny. There are tens of meters across. The first one we looked at was Hydra. And we had a very big surprise when we uh, deconvolved that. Uh, so this is an image of Nix. Uh, you can see it's got little pockmarked craters all around it. Uh, and some black and white, some color enhanced of the different ones. This is Styx, the smallest of them all. It's, it's around nine kilometers across. And that's the best we got right now. I don't know if we have any more on board the cam, uh, on board the, tel uh, the spacecraft yet. Um, can you play this movie real quick? This is just showing you uh, the rotation of the uh, moons on their axis as they're going around the pluto Charon system here. And you see this one's just going berserk. So uh, wrapping this up, um, we have a ton of data still on the spacecraft. We've been downloading data since the flyby on a regular basis. But there's so much data up there, and the bandwidth is so low. How many of you guys remember 200 baud modems? Yeah, well, we're a little bit better than that. Not by much. Um, it's going to take us on the order of 12 to 16 months to get all the data down from when we did the flyby. At this point, we're not quite a quarter of the way through the data that's on the spacecraft. So there's still Christmas presents on the spacecraft for us to, to see and discover. There's still new things that we have not learned about this system. And so the next, uh, next six to eight months is going to be a fun, exciting time still as we learn more stuff. Meanwhile, the spacecraft is not idle. We're not idle. We are heading out to another object called KB0 2014 MU69. You can say that three times real fast, and you will get the prize. I don't know what that prize will be, but you can get it. We will be passing by this little tiny Cape Kuiper Belt object. It took the Hubble Space Telescope to find this thing. It's so tiny and so faint. 
It's going to take us a little over three years to get there, three and a half years from the time we did the flyby of Pluto. So we'll be there uh, in uh, January 2019, if I remember. And the thing's like, uh, I believe it's like 40 meters across. So it's not really big. Uh, so we'll, who knows what we'll learn when we get there and if we'll find anything out further that we'll be able to see. That's, uh, that's our object right there. And uh, if you want to follow along with uh, the, the data as it comes down and is posted to uh, the websites, uh, these are the ones I would point you to to go see. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Mark. And uh, since we're um, video recording this, we would like to have the questions uh, using the microphone, the questionnaires. Yes. Awesome. Um, OK, so I have a question right off. Uh, approximately, what's the temperature of the surface of Pluto? Oh, man. I knew someone was going to ask me that. I forgot. Um, it's around 40, 60 degrees Kelvin. So uh, not swimsuit weather for terrestrial beings, but Plutonians are fine. And how thick is the uh, atmosphere? Um, it's uh, pushing around 1,000 kilometers, I believe. It's, it's, it's much thicker than uh, Earth's atmosphere. Question. Yeah, I did. Okay. Oh, how close is it going to get to the next object? I don't know. Oh, okay. Um, we're, the, the NAV team is still plotting everything out, but I, I don't know how close we're going to ultimately get. But Yeah, I was wondering how you'd be able to even redirect to get there, because we are not going to get much we, of a boost from Pluto, obviously. No, we, we have a little bit of fuel, uh, uh, propellant fuel on the spacecraft to do this. After we flew past Pluto, we had a few months' time where we uh, had a cone where we could redirect the spacecraft to, and we had spent many months ahead of time, prior to the flyby, looking with Earth-based telescopes to see if we could find anything there. Found nothing, called into Hubble, Hubble found a couple objects, and we looked into where they were, and it was gonna be visit this one or visit this one. And with the data we had from Hubble, the decision was made by the science team to visit this target as opposed to this target. I don't know the full rationale behind it, but they're both small targets. Do we know what comes out of a cryovolcano? Not exactly. At least I don't. How fast is New Horizons traveling at this point? It's traveling about 31,000 miles an hour. Uh, during the flyby video, it looked like there were some circles that actually were around uh, both Pluto and Carrion. What were they? Those are the orbits of the other moons. So, the, so, the, they're, the, so they're visible? No, the, the, the circles <laughs> are just representative of where the moons uh, would be orbiting around as we were flying by. So you could see how close we were going to get to the planet relative to where the, the orbits of the moons were. So we were inside the orbits of the moons when we got there. Uh, another little uh, trivia note I should point out is I tried to emphasize uh, how difficult this mission was to uh, accomplish given the, the distance out there, the time it took to get out there, and where we needed to go with the timing and the pointing and the distance. And we pretty much hit the bullseye within, I believe, tens of kilometers, and I think we were off by maybe 30 seconds on the timing on, after all that. So, you know, you could... You could uh, it, do analogy of firing an arrow from New York to uh, Shanghai, hitting the eye of a statue, firing a second arrow, splitting the first arrow, and then splitting it with a bullet on the third shot. That's how good our nav team was. How does your resolution compare to that of the Hubble Space Telescope? Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that short of the images I showed you. Did you see the other, other earlier images? 
Can you quantify the, oh, the contrast? Like, um, we're going to be down to meters of resolution, where Hubble was down 300 uh, miles. Wow. Thank you. <clears throat> interested in that uh, dust uh, collector I mean uh, w what is it actually able to collect and uh, uh, and then also with any any previous dust collector that collected anything meaningful or significant to us yeah uh, I, I didn't hear your first question right right yeah I mean uh, oh, that's what you just wanted to know about student dust collector yeah. what is collecting and how does it compare to others um, it's basically what we're, we're measuring with that is what's in interplanetary space as we're flying past it. So it's, it's getting hit by little particles that we run into as we go along. And it, it picks up those little particles and says, okay, I have one here, and I have one here, and I have one here. And we can make a, uh, a profile of the, the flight path that we went on and how much dust we've hit in that flight path. It's not like... Uh, a dust cloud from underneath a bed, you know, we're talking a particle every, you know, many, 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 many kilometers, tens of kilometers before you hit a particle, and another one tens of kilometers later, if, if it's that thick, or it could be hundreds or thousands of kilometers between particles. Um, so we're, we're measuring what the, the density of the inter interplanetary medium is with this. Uh, as far as how it compares to other dust collectors, uh, I believe this is the only one that's operating that far out in the solar system. Uh, all the other dust collectors on other spacecraft stopped operating before, I believe, before they even got past Uranus's orbit. So this is truly unique data that's being collected by these students. Uh, could you give a quick breakdown of the comm links and the power? Bandwidth uh, on you know, both ends. No, I can't. Right, can't really. that, that was not my bailiwick. Oh, uh, we, I can give you a, an overview that we use the deep space network to communicate with the spacecraft. Uh, there's three. I actually took this slide out because I only had 45 minutes to talk to you guys. Usually, I have an hour. Um, there's three stations scattered around Earth at about 120 degrees apart. There's one in uh, Goldstone, California. There's one in Canberra. Uh, Australia and there's one in Madrid, Spain. It's a series of a suite of uh, radio telescopes. Most of them are 34 meters. There's uh, one or two 70 meter telescopes at each of these locations. And all the spacecraft that are in the solar system use these antenna to communicate with Earth. So that's our deep space network. And so what we have to do, if we want to communicate with uh, New Horizons, download data, send commands up, we have to uh, jockey with all the other spacecraft that are in the solar system for time on these when, it's, when they're all pointing in the different directions. That much I can tell you. And don't have a ticket yet. Uh, we've got some tickets here for the drawing for the two imaginary books that we have. So any other questions? Are you guys good for the evening? Okay. Oh, hold on. What, what percentage of mass is the big moons versus Pluto, like Charon's mass versus uh, Pluto? Charon's is about one-eighth of Pluto's mass. Well, thank you guys all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. All right. Um, and like as I said before, these, these books were um, actually just being released uh, on Monday, and um, Amazon doesn't have, it, have them yet. But you guys um, give me your address and I'll mail it to you.